Morris. I'm a, a recovering sex addict. I've been around the rooms of sexual recovery for 35 years. I started um, in my own recovery when I was in my 20s. Um, in my 30s, I joined the field, um, and I've been working ever since, writing books, opening treatment centers, um, designing treatment of various levels. And I've always been a strong believer in um, technology as a means of improving our lives. And so here we are. <laughs> um, I've been in the field about 25 years and uh, as a professional. And um, what I want to do in this experience is to try to bring you as much information, um, whether you're a recovering person or you're thinking about it or you don't understand any of this, or you're involved with someone who has an issue or, you know, whatever, wherever you're coming from, I know there aren't a lot of places where you can ask simple questions about compulsive or addictive sexual behavior. Lord knows who would want to. And, uh, but here's a place where you can, and uh, we're used to talking about it and we have a little bit of experience. So um, we're here to share our um, knowledge and uh, support you. Um, Tammy said you're not private. What she means by that in this particular environment is that um, we, um, we are at, we're going to ask questions that you're presenting us with, but no one's going to see your face, no one's going to hear your last name, no one's going to know anything about you. But if you say in your question, you know, where you live and who your therapist is, it's going to, then people are going to know who you are. So it's up to you how private you are in this particular uh, setting. And we'll talk more about what we're doing uh, in other environments later and how we may or may not be able to help you. But for the sake of this meeting, your only job is to ask questions um, related to sex, love, and relationship addiction or co-occurring addictions or sexuality in general. And our job is to uh, interpret those questions and give them back to everyone else in the room in a way that hopefully is useful for everybody. Um, I often start with a little topic and I guess, you know, I, 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 um, I'm a Jewish man so I can't help but be affected by what's going on around me. And um, I feel uh, impotent. I feel like I have no power and there's nothing that I can do to prevent people from being hurt and, um, and, and from being singled out for being hurt. And that makes me very sad. Um, and I don't know where this will begin or end, but I certainly have seen um, other Jews in other perfectly safe environments not become not so safe very quickly. And so I worry for myself, I worry for my friends, I worry for our country. And uh, I, I say that because I would imagine no matter your religion, no matter um, what's going on, you're probably feeling the effects of, um, of some of the challenging news that's going on. And I think it's important to state that that affects us where, you know, and I'm not talking about politics, I'm talking about seeing people hurting, seeing people, families fearful, seeing fear and violence affects all of us and especially those of us who are in recovery um, or those of us who have these kind of issues because we already tend to be um, fairly vulnerable to what's going on around us we are we are sensitive folks and um so i didn't want to start tonight without acknowledging that you know almost a dozen people died um, on saturday and that we're all feeling the effect of whatever that means to you um in in this country at this time um, but it affects us personally. Some of us want to act out. Some of us want to control everyone or everything around us. You know, some people like to go take a drink. So, um, you know, but we don't do those things. We move forward. So anyway, Tammy, that's, um, I'm just really mentioning an awareness of things that are going on around us because it's important to, we, many of the folks in this room, including me, grew up in places where families were, no matter what was going on, you just kind of went on. You know, dad may be lying on the floor drunk or mom may be, but we, the family just went on. And so it's important for me and this little family to acknowledge when stuff is going on in the world that might affect us. Um, doesn't mean we should in any way talk about it, but just to say, oh, wow, yeah, today's a troubling day. That's important to acknowledge. Well, so, I think not only do you, did you just have to go on, but it, it couldn't be talked about. It, you know, there would even be the veneer of, you know, everything's fine, you know, everything's fine here. So, so there wasn't um, a, an opportunity to, to do that. And, and I think those uncomfortable feelings often, like you just mentioned, is I'm going to go drink or I'm going to go act out or I'm going to go do something because I don't know what to do with these feelings. Or what's wrong with me? I know for me, you know, if you grow up with a lot of trauma or abuse in childhood, it's not unusual to, for example, many of the people I work with, and I can include myself in this, if I'm starting to come down with a cold, sometimes I don't know if I'm feeling depressed 
or if I have something physical going on because the feelings are often the same. And um, I've been walking around all day saying, what's wrong with me? Why aren't I in a better mood, blah, blah. And I realize that these things that are going on in the world are really troubling to me. And uh, I don't want them to be. I want to be able to be fine and not affected by anything that's going on out there because that's how uh, many an addict would like to be. But the reality is we are affected by the things that we see and feel and it's important that we acknowledge them. Um, so that's cleaning up up to today. Do we have some questions? We uh, do. Great. Okay, so this, uh, this one is, I am a female who was betrayed by my husband of 25 years. He started a two year affair with a younger woman, 25 years younger than me um, in 2016. How do I not compare myself with her physically and sexually? Well, um, listen, you can compare yourself to her physically and sexually all day and you're going to come one down every time. So I say, you know, if you want to compare yourself to someone who is 25 years younger than you, go, go at it. <laughs> but that's sort of like saying, how much can I beat myself up? And so, you know, my question to you is what difference does it make whether she's 20 or 70 or perfect or imperfect or what matters here is that, that, that um, the person that you believed would have your back and would be there to support you uh, bailed on you, um, left you in an extremely vulnerable situation and isn't taking responsibility for it. And all you're left with are your doubts and fears about yourself. So, you know, I, if you can... Sometimes it's easier to want to take control of a problem by blaming ourselves for it. If there's a way that you can see yourself as a victim of this situation rather than as responsible for it, it will be easier for you to heal. I understand that we want to have control over situations that don't make any sense to us or are painful. You know, when someone dies, when someone goes crazy, when someone starts drinking, we want to say, oh, what's, I know I have a part in that. If we're close to them, it's inevitable we're going to feel that way. But sometimes people do things because they, they don't have us in mind at all. And that would be the part that would be what I would invite you to think about is, wow, I lived with someone and was involved with someone deeply for a long time who has probably been really unavailable for a long time. And how did I make that okay for me? Um, how did I make that okay for me when I deserve so much more? Rather than what's wrong with me that this person left me, I might turn that in, inside out and say, what's wrong with me <laughs> that I put up with getting as little as I did for as long as I did? that might be a more productive question um, because it's, he didn't leave you for a 25 year old. Um, he ran away from a connection with you for something new and sparkly like a Christmas present. But sometimes, you know what, Christmas presents get old too. Anyway, um, Tammy, other questions? Sure. So the next one is my husband is a sex addict. He declines SA meetings. He is only participating in celebrate recovery. Is it as effective as SA meetings? Um, I, uh, I, and, and Tammy, you can help me with this. I think Celebrate Recovery is a Christian. Christian offshoot. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a different, it, it's similar to the 12 steps in some ways, but they have, it's a particular Christian founded. So the only, the only issue that I might have, and I can't say this specifically because about this group, but with some organizations that view sexuality through a religious lens, and that can be Jewish, it can be Christian, it can be Muslim, it can be whatever. But those who have a more conservative viewpoint, there can be things that get really skewed based on the, the religion or the spiritual belief that has nothing to do with mental health. And this is a mental health addiction issue. So for example, um, I've worked in, in faith-based organizations where women can get blamed for not being sexual enough, for not being attractive enough, for not giving enough to their husbands. Because if a woman isn't keeping her husband satisfied, it really is her responsibility. That's one example of a line of thinking that I've heard in some more conservative environments that I wouldn't agree with if, in this sort of non-religious world. Um, I would be, I think, so there can be more misogyny. There can be more judgment of different orientations or, you know, just, um, they're not, um, I guess this is the best way I can say it. If you have a mental health problem and you, or an addiction problem, it's probably, um, if you can heal in an environment that is neutral 
around spirituality, that sees spirituality as a broad-based issue, but not necessarily as any one particular religion, I think that's probably a really good way to start. And then to bring that into your own spiritual beliefs is, is great. But sometimes some of the spiritual and conservative religious organizations can get uh, skewed around what is healthy sex and what isn't. And I've seen people get hurt, wives in particular, around that. So, you know, I don't know enough myself about Celebrate Recovery or how they view spouses or how they view how much responsibility they ask your husband to take for his actions. I just, those are the parts that I don't know about. But um, I would not necessarily worry so much about where he's going, but I would look more at how he's doing. You know, is he communicating communicating to you about his recovery? Is he letting you know what's going on with him? Is he letting you in about what they're talking about and what they're working with? Not other people's stories, but you know, if you're getting a sense that you are being brought into his experience and you feel good about it, um, and by the way, a celebrate recovery should have some kind of spouses or partners group that you should be able to go to. Um, you know, then I feel good about it. But if I felt shut out you know, devalued, pushed away, not included, not supported. I would wonder if that was the best place for him to be getting help. Um, somebody said something in the chat. Yeah. So can I tag on to what you're saying with Celebrate Recovery? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think a lot of what you said is, yeah, it, you know, if he's, you know, we talk about SA, SAA, SLAA, there, I mean, there's lots of different ones and people need to find their right space. If he's making progress and celebrate recovery and, you know, the behavior is stopped and he's doing, then, then fine, you know, but if, if there are some warning flags, you know, I, I almost wonder just because your level of discomfort. Um, the other thing about celebrate recovery, my experience is limited, but my experience is there's usually one meeting a week and, um, you know, for myself, when I got into recovery, recovery, I needed lots of meetings a yeah. week because I had all this time. And from my standpoint, if I wasn't in my addictive behavior, I was planning mine or, you know, whatever. So, so there was all this time. And so filling that time with, with things that were good for me and good for my recovery was really imperative. And so if it's one hour a week that he's going to a meeting and he's not engaging in other things, that would be more of an issue for me. But, you know, Rob is on in the rooms on Friday night. We're doing this. We did a, a webinar earlier today. There's other ways to connect. So if it's, you know, if he's, you know, if he's working through, um, like Rob's Sex Addiction 101 is great. There's other, you know, workbooks and things like that too. If, if he's doing some things that are advancing his recovery, then, you know, then great. So, and at the end of the day, you probably can't make him go to something else anyway. <laughs> right? Okay, next question. Uh, this is from a mid 30s single male, uh, currently in therapy with a licensed sex therapist. And uh, so sex therapist is different than sex addiction therapist. So I'm, I'm reading what's written. It used to be once a week, now it's every other week and soon to be once a month. I've been seeing him since April and feel like a totally different person since then. I feel great. How long should I keep this up? Is there a set time? I love it and find it helpful, but therapy isn't cheap. Well, yeah, um, I'm not sure why you saw this person. So I wouldn't really have an, you know, I know people who have certain issues to work on sexually, clarification, support, direction, insight, education, six months, four months of seeing somebody. It's an amazing, you know, amazing life-changing experience. And I know other people have, you know, deeper underlying longer term issues. Therapy is not necessarily about being there forever. It's about getting the problem solved. So if you feel you got your issues resolved and you feel good about where you're headed, fantastic for you. You know, that's a say for therapy. Um, so, um, you know, it's all up to the consumer. Yeah. And I don't think, you know, I don't think there's any set time for, for me. Initially, I went to therapy for a long time, you know, more advanced individual and group. And now it's like when something comes up, you know, and so I, you know, I've, I had something last year and I went for a while and now I'm not going for a little bit. So 
it, I think that's a great way of thinking about it, Tammy. It's I don't look at it as a one time like I went to therapy and now I'm done. I look at it as more uh, uh, often in my life I need guidance, and sometimes friends and family or faith can be guiding me. Sometimes I need to see an expert. It, you know, I'm I'm open to whatever help, whatever gets me along a little bit faster and better. I'm up for that. So, well, and I think. For me, every single time my therapist and I have had the discussion, it wasn't like I just quit. It was like, I think I'm okay right now. And my therapist is there. As soon as I want to reach back out to her, I can. But, you know, for now, it's okay. And so, so to, I would invite you to have the conversation with the therapist and give the reasons why you don't think you might need to continue right now or whatever. But, you know, I think coming up with that in a, in a, mutual agreed upon fashion probably invites the best outcome to that's my thought okay next question i was in a years long online emotional affair my wife does not understand how i could maintain that double life for so long how could i act like that for so long it took daily action even when things were going well in our relationship can you help us both understand this type of acting out well, um, it's not hard for me to understand what your wife doesn't understand because I'm a man and men's brains are different than women's brains. One of the things about men's brains that are different is that we have a greater ability to compartmentalize parts of our emotional lives. Um, it's why we are maybe a little better built for war or maybe we, those of us who survived going through a lot of war, you know, evolved into beings who were able to put parts of ourselves on hold. So, you know, this is how like, um, like I can, um, as a man, let's say go to a strip club with a bunch of guys and could consider it a great time if we all went in the back and had sex with the prostitutes. And as long as we don't tell our wives, it's no big deal. Um, and that's probably how we feel. Like, you know what, it was no big deal as long as our wives don't find out. But if our wives found out, they would say, you know, I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. How could you be with someone else? Like, well, but I just paid them. It wasn't like I cared. Men and women think differently about things. Um, our brains work differently. And in part, uh, it is easier, much easier for a man to put a relationship or situation in a box and say, that one's over here and this one's over here. Women tend to be more holistic thinkers. This is truly how it works. So a guy can say, well, I went off and I did this over here, but that doesn't have anything to do with that thing over there. And a woman will tend to think, well, but what about our kids? What about our family? What about our church? What about our home? It becomes one big fabric or kaleidoscope for a woman. For a man, it's more like a bunch of boxes that are strung together uh, if we are someone who's living with secrets. So I don't think the question is really like, What's wrong with him that he could do that? Because I think a lot of men can compartmentalize for long periods of time. It's a survival mechanism for us. It can also be a way to play and get away with a lot of stuff we shouldn't. Um, but the question is, I think, what did I mean to him? What did our relationship mean if he kept it? Well, what do I mean? You know, what is, an, what, is, what, is a, what is a relationship? Sorry, and, and, and maybe I'm getting more basic. See, Tammy, Tam, you know what? There's an, an interaction, because I watch your nodding. I'm like, okay, if, I'm, if she thinks I'm getting it, I must be getting it. Um, <laughs> you're, you know, yes, no, I agree. Um, I think what I really want to say to you is, what do you, want, what do you want in a relationship? Because I want intimacy. And what intimacy means to me is that I am fully known by my partner and my partner fully knows me. Um, that there are no secrets between us. There's nothing hidden between us that we can rely on each other because there aren't going to be any bumps down the road that we ha haven't anticipated um, unless, you know, it shows up, it shows up. But, but there's nothing between us. And that's what a real intimate relationship is. It's not about how often you have sex. It's not about how often you smooch. It's about how often, how well known you are to each other and how much you value and look out for each other because you are so well known to each other. And that can't happen when you're living with someone who is willing to live a completely double life and not only see how it affects him, but not really consider how it might be affecting you. And this is my, and I'll stop after this, but you know, I was a lousy sex addict in the sense that I would feel badly about 
sexually acting out outside my relationships. It really bothered me that I was leaving my spouse out of a part of my life that I thought they would be angry at and they wouldn't want me to do it. But a long time ago, I remember this, you know, and I can't imagine carrying on years and years of a loving dual relationship. Um, I can't imagine that anyone in your situation would be left feeling like they could ever fully trust or hope for something in this person again. And so I guess it, lastly, you know, I, I would be looking less to him and more to yourself about, you know, what do you want in a relationship? What do you want in this relationship? Is this person able to give you what you want if you could even move forward? Um, he's the one who screwed this up, but you're the one who gets to decide what you want going forward. Well, you know, and I always think of um, that emotional behavior. It's the, like you talked about the Christmas ornaments and lights. It's, you know, it's the fantasy. It's, you know, this is an online thing. So it's all woohoo. And I can make it whatever I want it to be versus the humdrum life of, you know, paying bills and, you know, going grocery shopping and all those mundane things that are the reality of living with somebody that we, that, you know, that you truly love, right. but you know, but you know, it's, it's the escape and it doesn't, I, my experience is it isn't always escape from this relationship. It's escape from whatever pain or whatever it is that I don't want to deal with. So, um, it's not an answer, but you know, there's, it's so complicated. It's not like there's just one thing and this is how it is. It's like, it's an escape and it's a long-term pattern and there's a whole bunch of things to unpack. And I actually, I'll add one more thing to that. You know, when you are in an affair, whether it's live or online, um, there is this feeling of springtime. There's this feeling of moonlight. There's this feeling of, oh, if only we could be together that you don't get, as Tammy said, when you're farting next to somebody late at night when you've had too much ice cream. You know, it just doesn't happen. It's a different kind of love. And that you know, that kind of love that is romantic and exciting and new. And, you know, we all know that that's like, we all know that there are deeper things that we want. And so we, we don't go searching for that in the relationships we have. We understand that they deepen. Maybe you're involved with someone who wants his cake and eat, wants to eat it too. You know, he wants to have the flirtation and the excitement and the romance. He also wants to be in the thick of things with a partner, but you can't have both. <laughs> so... I was answering an email earlier today and they were talking about wanting happily ever after. And I kind of went to that. It's like, exactly. you know, there, there is no happily ever after where it's, you know, Disneyland and everything else. It's, you know, it's the mundane things, but the, that I'm in this with you. And, and to me, it's the deeper, richer relationship that you get rather than just the starry eyed things. Well, and, and I'll add to that. So putting in a plug for long-term relationships, I know what, if you haven't been in a 15 or 20 year relationship, you don't know the difference between the ripples on the top and the deep currents on the bottom. Meaning if you've been dating for six months or a year and someone is a jerk for three months, you must just, might just decide they're really a jerk. But if you've been living with someone for 15 years and they're a jerk for three months, it's like, oh, they must be going through a bad couple of months. It's not the whole of how you think of them. And um, yeah, I, I actually love 20 years of marriage. I, I think it's a great thing. So yeah. Well, and, and I, and I know so many people that have found their path through this and, and ultimately, and I'm going to share this because I just heard of another story this last weekend and they're grateful for for the problems, for the infidelity or whatever it was, because it allowed them to work on themselves and their relationship to come to a deeper place than they ever were, you know, even maybe when they said, I do. So, um, I think, or not. Yeah, or not. Not everybody's supposed to stay together. I, I clearly acknowledge that. But, you know, if, you know, if there's still something there that's worth working on, then it's still something there that's worth working on. So, okay. So last week, um, it was mentioned that sex addicts feel like acting out even after 20, 30 years later. Sounds frightening for a spouse. Totally understand that. For um, my recovering alcoholic friend does not feel like drinking 20 years later. What's no. the difference, please? This is a great question. Um, one of the goals in AA they talk about is for the obsession of, with drinking to go away. And then at some point it may for some people for long periods of time. And the truth is, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a terrible analogy, but 
when you get out of the habit of doing something for a while, it's you sort of stop thinking about it. And even for someone who is as ingrained of a disorder as an alcoholic, when you haven't had a drink for five or six years, it may not be what you think of right away on a bad day. Some days, I've had alcoholic friends with 25 years who found out they had cancer and were facing treatment, look at me and say, I really want that drink you're having. I've seen it in their eyes. But in the day in and day out when life's not so bad, most alcoholic friends I know don't think about drinking because it isn't a part of their day-to-day -day life. But if you have a disorder that involves sex or eating, for example, you're faced with those choices every single day. And so when I, you know, we, it is not healthy for someone to, who has a problem with eating to stop eating and stop thinking about eating. It's not healthy for a human being to stop being sexual or stop thinking about being sexual. So when you're dealing with behaviors that, that are problem behaviors that are occurring within um, a naturally occurring function that you want to keep enjoying as a part of life, then that person will always face some of the inevitable challenges of, well, I'm enjoying lust. I lust with my partner. I have sex with my partner. I love my partner. But that means I might also see a person on the street and feel lust. I enjoy hunger. And that really makes me enjoy my meal tonight because I let myself get hungry. But sometimes that means I'm hungry for cheesecake, even though I shouldn't have it. So, you know, um, I think maybe that's, that's helpful. And, and Tammy, do you have anything you want to throw in? Well, I was thinking, you know, I think the big thing is just, you know, with that much time, you have tools. So you, you know, you were sharing last week and you recognize it and you go, what's really going on? So just because there's the thought of it doesn't mean the action happens. So it, you know, and, and that's true with alcoholics too. And I've had some situations where I went, you know, if I drank, this would be a day I would drink, you know, and I can acknowledge that and just, you know, but I go, but here's all the problems that are going to be caused by me drinking. And, you know, it goes quickly away. I can think through not why I don't want to do that. So, so yes, while those thoughts might happen and you can't really stop those thoughts, but you can choose what you do with them and what your next, I can choose yeah. to do the next right thing. And I want to validate also that having worked with so many partners over the years that um, you don't want to hear this. You know, you want to hear that someone's going to go to some therapy, some meetings, and they're never going to think about this again. And Lord knows, I wish, in fact, I think there are years where I just didn't mention that someone would struggle for this for the rest of their lives. You guys were so glad they came out of treatment and they were smiley faced and telling you the truth. And I thought, well, why, you know, tell these partners that this isn't going to go away, but it doesn't, you know, and because that's true. This is deep brain injury at an early time in life. I'm pointing to the back of the brain here. And uh, it doesn't go away because life changes today. But the actions that I take when I get that trigger from back there, as Tammy said, are different actions than I took in the past if I, if I keep up with myself and I pay attention. So you will live with someone who has a chronic illness. It's an emotional illness. I wish I could tell you that they were cured, but they're not. It's chronic and it can come back. And, you know, um, hopefully you're living with someone who loves you and themselves enough that if it does come back in a serious way, they'll own up to it and get some help right away. And as difficult as that sounds with the chronic and all of that, on the other hand, you know, I continue to do things for my recovery and I believe that I have made progress, you know, over, in fact, I know for sure, I, you know, I, I do enough self-reflection and accountability that I realize that I have made progress on who, refining who I am over every marked period. You know, I always think of like two years ago, I like the person I am now better. In two years, I want to do, I want to be that much better. And, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to no, take too long. Okay. I know we have more questions, but I want to say one more thing about that. But, they, but Tammy, that implies, and this is something that this person needs to look for, that you are a person, Tammy, who wanted to, wanted to keep working on yourself, who wanted to keep growing. Because if, you, if your spouse has been sexual acting out and then he or she puts that down and then they say, okay, well, aren't you glad I went to some treatment, did some meat, whatever it is, I'm done with that. And you hear me say, well, it's chronic and they say, no, I'm fine, I'm cured, you know, then I would be worried about how they are approaching it. Because 
not everyone is going to want to say, well, good, that's behind me. I've told you everything, and now I'm going to keep working at it. A lot of people are going to say, whew, now I don't have to deal with that anymore. What they don't realize or if they haven't been educated is that the thoughts will come back, and they need to be well prepared for that. And, and one more little thing about this. Some people who are in a crisis, they really got in trouble for their sexual behavior. They got arrested, they got a disease, their wife found out, whatever, they lost their job, whatever it is. I've heard so many people say, you know, I just, after that happened to me, I know I'll never do that again. Yeah. And in the moment of feeling afraid about your wife leaving or the kids finding out or the police or what, in those months surrounding some kind of crisis, it can often feel like that has gone away. And the person who's in the crisis, because they're so scared of what happened, isn't even letting themselves get close to that feeling or thought. And they think, okay, well, I'm kind of cured of that. This incident cured me of that. But the reality is, is that's not how we get cured or anything close to it. That simply pushes the inevitable away a little bit further. The former president of uh, ASAM, which is the American Society of Addiction Medicine, made a comment once uh, that uh, there is no S in addiction, addiction is addiction. And to me, that means if, if I stop this one behavior, and if somehow by the sheer willpower I'm able to stop this one behavior, it's going to come out in another form. And for me, that was true. It's like I, you know, I quit this behavior and I developed another, you know, act. I developed another addiction in recovery and the shame of dealing with that was worse because I should have known better. And so, you know, I had to find a path through that. And the path was continuing to work on myself because I would have just kept going. Anything you can get addicted to, I'd be going to a 12 step meeting for if I didn't get to the issue that was causing me to have to escape. So that's my two cents. Questions? Yes. I recently completed the disclosure process with my fiance. It went extremely well and we're feeling closer both emotionally and sexually. However, I don't want to be complacent in my recovery. What can I do? Well. Yes. So oh, to keep it on track, so. Oh. Um, are, uh, is this the, the person who did disclosures, the, ad, the person who's writing is an addict or a partner? I think this is the addict. I don't want to be complacent in my recovery. What can I do to keep it on track? Well, I think that, well, I, I will, a couple of suggestions. For people who are doing well in recovery, the first place that you'll see yourself getting complacent is in your self-care. So it's often the case that people are so worried about, I'm going to have a slip like in the middle, the, the, the most problematic part of their behavior, that they forget that what makes us stay away from the behavior and in fact thrive away from the behavior is enjoying our lives. And so, you know, one thing you can really do is be committed to a recreational activity, be committed to a creative activity, be committed to special time with your family or friends that have deep meaning to you. Make sure that your life is fun and enjoyable in the moment and that you're staying connected to the things that made you helped you recover, because um, you know we we have to have we have to enjoy our lives. Like we can, uh, a lot of us, especially those of us in relationships, when a partner is very very angry, we just feel like, gosh, I, I just got to go to meetings three days a week, and I got to go to therapy two days a week, and I've got to go to the uh, the shelter and and make sure people get fed the other two days a week, and it's all sackcloth and ashes. And the truth is, is that. Um, the brain, in order to begin to heal, has to still experience pleasure. And if it isn't going to be all that sexual and romantic intensity, it needs to be the pleasure of having fun with my kids, the pleasure of finally painting that room that I've been meaning to paint, the pleasure of getting that degree I never thought I would get. And um, so, yeah, the thing you can do is be as invested in making sure you have a good, enjoyable life as you are in making sure you don't go back to where you were. Uh, agree. Okay. So then um, the person shared last week that her husband had committed suicide. She's in a group, um, a group therapy, and it, they want her to continue in the group as they feel um, like they have gotten support from me and they have been incredible since the tragedy. Do you think it's important for me to stay in the group? Is it too scary for others in the group? She doesn't want to be a liability to them. Um. I think, uh, well, just a personal response to you. I think you should listen to the voices that are, you're getting. 
In other words, if everyone says, welcome, come on in, why are you saying, gee, am I welcome? That's not up to you. And I think one of the first things we really learn in this part of the process is, you know, that other people get to say and feel what they're going to say and feel, and we can't control it. So when I hear all, all hands on deck, you are welcome here, I say appreciate the welcome. And, and, and maybe, just maybe, these people are valuing you because you remind them of the challenge that's ahead and how grateful they are to support you. You know, so I, anyway, I'm just, I think it, you're there for all the right reasons. I'm so happy for you. I, you know, I agree. I think, I, I think it's great. So, More and questions. then the, the only other question. So if other people have questions, um, the only other one is a comment. It's thank you. It does sound scary for spouses to live in the fear for the long term. So let me then, let me then take a moment and tell you what we're doing here and why we're here. Um, we have launched a website, uh, Tammy and I, but, but the company that we work with and the people that we work with, that is intended to be a fully live, fully interactive uh, community. Um, this comes from my belief that, you know, the same reason you guys are here, there's 31 of you here, I don't know why, but I assume you wanna connect, you wanna learn, you wanna be a part of something, and you weren't getting the answers you wanted one-on-one -on -one or in a book. And so, I, I believe that a lot of the websites that are there to help people right now are just basically informational. You, you get a little, you learn about their program, you can read a book, but, but sometimes we need to be somewhere now. And what we're hoping to do on the site is to have live, well, we're already creating them, live drop-in groups for support, um, live, um, sorry, is our Q&A failing? Is that why we're not lining up? No, we, we, have, a, we have another question, so. Okay, well, I'll just finish. Oh, it does. Okay, what? The more you can do to join us, um, sign up for Sex and Relationship Healing, come visit us, come to some of the groups. We're going to have groups for pastors, groups for gay guys, groups for partners, different kinds of lectures about sexuality, relationships. We're going to become a fully vital live community where you can come in from New Zealand at nine in the morning and you're going to find somebody doing a group on something or other. So, um, and Tammy's been wonderful. She's organizing that. The reason that we are here tonight is because this is one of those groups. Every Monday night at six o'clock, I do a Q and A on sex, love, and addiction. And Tammy is here to help guide the questions. And she's also here because she's the person. If you write us, if you call us, if you reach out, you're going to get hurt. And so I think it's really fair and important for you to see who it is who's going to be responding to the questions you might have to ask. And um, and also, you know, to hear she's a good counterbalance for me. Um, so welcome, and know that we'll be doing this uh, on Friday night. I'm on intherooms.com every Friday at six o'clock California time, and every Monday night I'm here at six o'clock on sex relationship healing. So and we um, had a webinar today at noon Pacific time with Jonathan Taylor, um, uh, and his is uh, rock and relationships, and he was talking about relationships and and good tools to use, whether it's a a uh, coworker, a uh, romantic relationship, you know, friendships, whatever. So that was really valuable tools. We did record that one and it'll get loaded up next week because Scott's on vacation, well-deserved. But um, uh, he, Jonathan has committed to being there every week. And so every Monday at noon Pacific time, there's another opportunity to uh, learn more about, you know, relationships from a different perspective. He answered questions on sex addiction too, but but really just, you know, good relationship tools overall as well. So, um, and the drop-in groups, uh, we're, we're creating those. In fact, we have somebody who may be offering a Spanish speaking one, which would be yeah. really fantastic too. That'd be fantastic. So a couple more questions. Are there prescription meds that regulate addict brains? My immediate, I gotta say this is like, that's what I was doing when I was out there using those. I was regulating my brain. So you, that was the little. Trying, you were trying to regulate your brain. But you I didn't, didn't do it very well. Let's put it well, that well, way. You did so. the best that you could under yeah. the circumstances. You didn't have all the tools that a prescription pad would mm -hmm. offer. Cool. But, but um, and they do talk about drug addiction, alcoholism, and, and sexual behaviors being self-medicating. And I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, you know, when you say an addict brain, it's kind of a broad way of putting it because there are many, like Tammy's addict brain is very different than mine. <laughs> I can, I'm, I'm not saying how different, just different. And, you know, so some of us, you know, for example, some of 
for some of us, it's the feeling of depression and loneliness and emptiness that pushes us into, into acting out. And something like an antidepressant can be helpful in alleviating some of that pressure. But for others of us, we're very obsessive, very compulsive, very anxious, and there's a whole different set of brain chemistry that goes along with that, that um, produces compulsivity and obsession. So, you know, and I know people who take antidepressants, and there's a side effect of lower sexual drive, and for them that really works. So, you know, I, I think there's more to diagnosing someone from a mental health and medication perspective than just uh, being an addict because people come to addiction from many, many different places and many, many different kinds of emotional problems that underlie addiction. And that has to be figured out. Um, the fact that they're an addict doesn't necessarily say, okay, here's the med for them. Um, you need a good psychiatrist for that. I agree. So the, the, there's a question in the chat I'm gonna go over to. Um, my SA husband and I watched the webinars together. That's great. I'm having a hard time celebrating his successes, such as recovery apps and attending meetings. How do I get that past this and be supportive? Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Um, let me try to help you with this one. This one is, this is what I can help you with. You don't have to celebrate any of his recovery. He cheated on you. He hurt you. He let you down. He lied to you. And even if he didn't, um, the fact that he has this problem is nothing to celebrate. Um, it's an added burden to your life and your relationship. So, you know, I often say, and I hear this a lot from the addicts that I work with, who will say, you know, I don't understand it. I went to my my 12-step program and I, you know, I've got 90 days of not seeing prostitutes or, or porn or, and I got this 90-day chip at the meeting and everyone gave me hugs and they said I was such a great guy. And, and then I went to my therapy group and I showed them my 90 day chip and everyone in the group said, wow, you're really cool. Look at that chip. You're really great. Give me hugs. And then I went home to my wife and I said, look at my 90 day chip. Aren't I great? And she said, uh, I'm sorry, you cheated on me for six years and I'm not supposed to celebrate that you haven't been with a hooker for 90 days. And, and, and he tells the story to the group or the 12 step program and everybody says, oh, you poor guy, your wife is so difficult. That is not the right answer. The answer is, is that not everyone is going to celebrate somebody's recovery. And if you are a partner who's been lied to, or you've had secrets kept from you, or you're just finding out the depth of the behavior that he or she was involved in, your job may be to just tolerate that you can still have them in the same house with you. Um, most partners job, in my opinion, is to be angry and to hurt and to try to figure out if they really want to continue with this person, and if so, how? So when your addict partner pulls you in and says, I just don't see why you're not as excited about my recovery as I am, you might say to him, well, because you hurt me, you let me down, you blew my dreams, you shattered my, you know, stuff like that. You have been victimized here. Um, it's not a, a appropriate or helpful for the person who victimized you to turn around and say, aren't you, you know, it's like, let try this on, okay, I'm going to be nice. If, if the man in your life was hitting you on a regular basis and then uh, he went to domestic violence counseling and he wasn't hitting you anymore, you probably wouldn't want to go to his reunions of the domestic violence group that was celebrating that you haven't been hit in a year or two. And so in the same way, you get to be angry and hurt. And this is not probably something you're going to be able to celebrate together. Good answer. Okay, here's someone who I have a tough time dealing with the recovery, specifically the low energy and mind feels blank. How, how to help this? Well, there's a couple answers to that. I mean, it depends on how long you've been in recovery. Um, people say, people ask me, you know, is there withdrawal from sex addiction or compulsive porn use? And my answer is absolutely. So what does withdrawal look like? If you are a sex addict, a porn addict, a romance addict, really putting all of that down is going to feel like it's going to bring up feelings of longing and emptiness and loneliness because that's what your brain has been doing is giving you a feeling that filled you up. And now you're feeling more empty and lonely. My question to you, and you're not going to answer this, but it's to anyone listening, is how long have you been feeling that way? Because if it's been a couple of weeks that you've been sober to 90 days, I would expect you're gonna feel that way. 
the other half is how much are you making sure that you're involved with people and checking in and getting support and going to support meetings and support groups because just stopping the behavior is not healing from the problem. It's just stopping the behavior. You have to also surround yourself with a kind of support that will make you feel better. The last thing I want to say is if you, if you're a few months into recovery, and you're still feeling this way, and you're really working hard at, at being connected and working on yourself, you need to go see a doctor and see if you're depressed. Because it's not unusual for addictions to be masking other emotional problems. That doesn't mean that if I treated your depression or I treated your anxiety that your addiction would go away. But it does mean that when you stop practicing the addiction, whatever it is, that some of those underlying things may start showing up. And some of them can be dealt with in day-to-day -day life, and some of them you may need to go see a therapist or a psychiatrist for. Um, I just I have been in recovery for 35 years. I have, uh, but it wasn't until I went through major depression in my late 30s that I got on medication. And I, I don't think I my life would be where it is today had I not gotten on the stabilization of medication, which I continue on to this day. Um, it provides me a platform, a solid foundation from inside of me from which to grow. And before I think I had kind of a, I think I was more floating on water. <laughs> okay, next question. If the wife asks her sex addict spouse to go to a dance class and the sex addict, oops, it just slid. And the sex addict says, no, don't wanna go. You can go and get your self care needs met with dancing with other guys. What's up with that? Sounds very dismissive. Uh, okay. Well, I hear two parts to this question. Um, one is, um, I want to go to dance. I want to take dance. I want to go fango, fadango, tango, larango, and you know, I and now is a chance to get my husband to do it because now he needs to work on recovery and recreation, and. You know, my response to that might be, well, maybe he hates dancing and maybe it'll be the most awful thing he ever did and he really doesn't want to do it. But that, even if that's true, number one, if he's really, really working on his recovery and understands the harm that he's caused you and the pain that he's caused you, he should just get his dancing shoes on and go along with it, whether he likes it or not, because you want to go, because you think it's fun and because he cares enough about you to want to give you pleasure in something you might enjoy. Um, the other half of it is that, you know, I don't, there's no reason for him to treat you that way. You know, if you offer something that you want to do and you think it'd be fun and he doesn't think it would be fun, why can't he say like, how sweet of you to come up with something that we might enjoy together. And even though that wouldn't be my thing, I wonder if we could go do this. Um, so I just don't understand why someone in recovery would turn to his spouse and and diminish their feelings in the way that you describe. I don't. That's the part that's not okay, in my opinion. Yeah, agree. So, okay, uh, we both came from very conservative religious families and were sexually, uh, or where sexuality was never discussed and dating was strictly forbidden. Uh, thank you for your resources; they've been invaluable. So that's just. Uh, comment. Um, I'm currently six months clean. My counselor is recommending that I join a support group for my next phase of recovery. What should I look for in a good support group? That's a great question. Um, is this related to sex addiction, Tammy? Do you think it it's sounds like it, um, but it does, it doesn't specifically say that, but, but you know, I, I'm going to, um, I'm going to kind of flip that on you and say that I think in part, um, it, 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 um, Look for what you want from a support group. Part of what I would want is to make sure that there was at least one or two people there who were around my age. Um, I've run enough groups to know that if you're 23 and everybody else is 43, they're going through different life experiences than you are. So, you know, you might need to be around someone who's just newly married or someone who's dating or someone who just had a baby. Or So one of the things that I'd be looking for in a group is people who have similar life experiences to me or in a similar place in life. Um, because I want to learn from them and I want them to be able to learn from me. Um, if it's an addiction group, I think the more, um, the more you have in common with the people in group, the better. So if there are sex addicts, 
who have seen prostitutes and had affairs and all that. That's great. You should probably be with them if you, that's your issue. If you're a porn addict who's never had sex with anyone, it's probably best for you to be in a group with a bunch of other young guys who are also in a porn addiction group. So again, I, I, I really think most, and let me say one more thing about that, that, that. I think most therapists will know what's right and wrong for a group, but there's also the person who's running it. And I think that you need to understand what kind of group is it? What is the purpose of this group? What is the focus of this group? And I'll give you an example. I ran many groups for years with addicts and my goal was always for you guys to stay connected and to get deeper connected. So in the therapy groups that I ran, if I wasn't there on a weeknight that we had group, I wanted you guys to get together and have dinner together and hang out. If I was on vacation for two weeks, I wanted you guys, you know, the eight people in group or whatever to go do something together because or or, or go have dinner before a group or meet after group. My goal was to help you build and have you really weave in and work in your social connections with those other men or women. Um, it, 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 addicts don't really necessarily at this point in early recovery need a group where, and there are kind of like more psychological groups where you don't never talk to anyone outside of group. You only do the work that's inside of group. You know, I, I don't think that that kind of a group would be one that I would recommend. So. What kind of a group is it? Who's going to be in the group? Last thing I'll say, if you're a guy and you're a sex addict, there shouldn't be any women in your group, period. If you're a woman and you're a sex and love addict, there shouldn't be any men in your group, period. If you're seeing a therapist and they say, well, welcome to my mixed group and you're a heterosexual sex addict, you don't belong in a mixed group. This is not a good place for us to talk about the stuff that we have to talk about. We are, this is like us going and doing counseling in a bar being an alcoholic, you know, it's just not a good idea. There are other places to do it. So one big red flag for me with group would be if someone in the group was going to be an opposite sex person that I was attracted to. Well, and from a support group standpoint, those drop-in groups, that's what we're going to develop with those is those will be safe places. There'll be a men's sex addiction group. There'll be a female sex addiction group. There'll be a partner's group. So there'll be groups where it will be people like you that can connect online in a safe space. So watch, if, if you haven't registered on our site already, please do so because then you'll get the emails that let you know about when those um, are scheduled. So those are coming up. And since time we brought that up, let me be really clear. Um, we are not allowed to do therapy online, so we're not doing therapy online. Um, the reason, what I mean by are not allowed to, just so you know, pardon me, is that in the United States, therapists are only allowed legally to do therapy within the states that we are licensed. So I'm licensed in California. If you live in New York or Ohio or, you know, or, uh, or Detroit, or Detroit I, I can't do therapy with you online. And so since I can't get therapists in every state in the union to run groups for every person, the only thing that we can do is offer you educational support. So your drop-in groups will be with somebody who will give you information and be there to give you direction, but they won't be doing therapy. And as such, it makes it a lot easier for us to give it away for free. Um, and uh, maybe we are the doorway through which you get a taste of some of the things that you can do later if that's what you choose to do. But we're going to be a pretty big doorway. I'm excited about that. Yeah, and, and we want to be an ongoing resource so people can keep coming back and connecting um, you know, for the long haul. Like you said, yeah, chronic, it, it, chronic it, it, disease, and we want to have a safe place. So. Yeah, and, and let me, I just want to say, because Tammy mentioned that, like we may work with one of you guys in a group like this, only maybe a more interactive one on the site. And then you might go to treatment and you might come back from treatment. And then there's somebody else in the group who's thinking about going to treatment. And then you have people who are at different ends of the experience talking about that. And, and those are the kinds of educational support we're hoping to offer. I'm sorry, Tammy. Please. So here, here's with us a support, a support group question. What happens if it's a male heterosexual, heterosexual married male who is acting out behavior was older men hmm. what would you recommend for a support group for someone like that so younger guy acting out behavior older men what would you well i'm, I'm not is he a gay guy I, I no ma married to a woman but his acting out behavior was same sex mm, well i don't I, I would need to know about, more about that i guess um <laughs> Um, because um, I would have a lot of questions about that. Okay. But, 
But most, let me, I will say something. I think what, whatever your fears are as a spouse about the group that your husband or wife is in, it's very important for you to communicate that to the group leader. There's nothing wrong with you calling your wife or husband's therapist and saying, hey, I'm the spouse and I just want you to know these are some concerns I have. And so for you to make sure that that therapist hears that this is your husband's history and your concern, should there be any men who might hit on him or play, you know, that that would be what he would do, um, that's good information for the therapist to have. Um, so, you know, the therapist is not going to be encouraging those kinds of relationships in group. Um, he's going to, he or she's going to be watching out for them. Okay. So I think my sex addicted spouse is still cheating with his comments and lack of initiative for love and caring. This is how he behaved before. Any suggestions? Um, I agree with you that if, um, that one of the signs that I would be looking for if I were a spouse um, and I was afraid that my husband or wife had gone back to acting out would be their lack of empathy. I think in general, when any addict returns to their addiction and they're trying to keep a secret, um, they start, they don't know it, they're not even conscious of it, but they start to push us away. Um, loving spouses, you know, we start to get blamed, they get irritable and all that stuff that you're talking about starts to happen again. So, yeah, it's not, a. I mean, people have a bad day, people have a bad week, whatever. And it's certainly, you know, I'm not in your relationship, but it is certainly worth your saying to him, look, this is the way you were acting when you were acting out. And this is the kind of behavior that leaves me not trusting you. And I can't be here if I don't trust you and be, and we don't. So in other words, it's one thing for a husband or a wife to be difficult or problematic or challenging, or it's another thing for them to be like that and not own it with a history with you of lying and keeping secrets because you're thinking in your head, well, if he's acting this way, maybe he's back to doing that. And that's something you guys really need to be able to talk about. I think we're out of time. Well, we have one quick one. And th this okay. is kind of, um, uh, th this is from someone whose um, sex addiction partner went to a trained therapist. And uh, the comment is that the therapist would not listen to anything that she said and bought into all the things that the SA spouse said. And uh, she felt that it was abusive. So she's trying to figure out how do I even uh, try to heal from the betrayal of the betray, you know, so there's the sex addiction betrayal and then there's the therapist added betrayal on top of that. Um, get support for yourself put a band of beautiful, loving people around you that are, will be there for you and, you know, really connect. And I'm talking about people who love you. Um, I mean, if this were going on in my life, I wouldn't feel safe at all. I don't know that I would feel safe with a counseling professional, but I would know that there were at least a few people in my life who had my back, whether it was my mom, my sister, my kid, whatever. And I would go for that support and hang out in that support for a while. Um, and, and I, and, and by the way, if you want professional support that will be safe, because that what you describe is devastating. I, I don't mean to undermine whatever work you're already doing, but you know, feel free to drop us a note. And one of the things that Tammy and I do and, and our team does, we'll refer to people all over the country, all, all over the world. World, yeah. And so, you know, drop us a note and say, I need to get some help and I live in this town in Ohio and we'll find you somebody who will be on your side and, and have your back. Um, and, and, and there's no shame in paying someone to do that. That's why we're here. So. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a lot of very good resources. So, so I think with that, we come to the end of our time together. Time. Thank you all, yeah. Thank you all for um, joining us and the great questions that you asked. Hopefully you found support ooh, with that. Ooh, yes. Ooh, ooh. yes. I yeah. want to remind everybody that we have a wonderful podcast called Sex, Love, and Addiction, uh, Stitcher, iTunes, Android, all that, and podcasts are free. Um, I blog for Psychology Today. I'm one of their top five bloggers. I've been doing that for years. I have a lot of amazing writing on there. Um, there's lots of resources you can find in Sex and Relationship Healing. We are here for you. Thank you for showing up tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Rob.